welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. We're super excited because this is the kickoff day to nonprofit power week with our friends over at I'd Bailey. Jeff Hensel, when I say over, I mean, I Bailey's throughout the country. So it's not like you're just in one part of our great nation. Um, you're everywhere. And we are delighted to have you here to talk to us about artificial intelligence, how it really is impacting our nonprofit sector and what that looks like. I'm joined today by uh, Miko Marquette Whitlock, the mindful techie of all things mindfulness is really an interesting combination with this topic, isn't it, Miko? Absolutely. And I'm excited to be here to talk about it. And I know that we're going to talk about some of the things that might be on top of folks' minds, but I'm hoping that we can sort of dive into some of the things that perhaps aren't as talked about as well as it concerns this topic in nonprofits. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's just something that creates um, it, a lot of consternation, fear, uncertainty. And so Jeff's going to really help us kind of get a new mindset, if you will. You know, one of the things that helps with my mindset are our presenting sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, our new episodes on Fridays just dedicated to the art and craft of fundraising and your part-time controller. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, joined today by one of our amazing co-hosts, Miko Marquette Whitlock, also known as the Mindful Techie. And so he is going to be uh, with me on this journey today as we discuss all things important with AI. Okay, Jeff Hensel, as a director with Ide Bailey, tell us what you do with them. That's a great question. And thanks, uh, Julia. Nice to uh, spend the time with you today. So my role at iBailey in, in the technology consulting group is to really help clients understand how to leverage technology um, and emerging technology in particular in my role uh, can be leveraged for their uh, organization, but probably just as importantly to make sure that it's the right fit that um, it's secured, that privacy is respected, and yeah. and then how does that map to not just you know three months or six months from now, but their long term goals and objectives? And so that's really what I do. You know, it's fascinating because I Bailey to the uninitiated is a, a national powerhouse, um, you know, accounting firm and finance. Uh, structure that really navigates so much business. You do have a very robust nonprofit sector um, that are, you know, practice that, that engages with things. I am fascinated that your firm has had to get involved in this technology piece because I suspect this is not just an accounting issue that you're talking about. And it's not, and I think that's a really good point. Uh, you know, from an iBailey standpoint, we've been doing, you know, accounting for over 100 years, uh, accounting and, and lots of other compliance-based work, uh, which is which is our backbone and it's our, our, our you know, our, our history. I think the reality is, is that technology impacts every organization. And so it doesn't matter what type of organization you are, technology is going to be a part of it. And, and so what we've learned, and as we've grown as a firm and as a, as a business advisory organization, as well as a compliance organization, is how do you weave those together so that the client gets the best outcome? And I think we're seeing that a lot, particularly with the pace of innovation now with technology. Wow. Miko, doesn't that sound that re that has to resonate with you? Absolutely. And I I'm not sure if we're, we're jumping ahead here, but I'm, I'm curious um, for f folks that I talk to, a lot of folks maybe feel overwhelmed or feel like they're behind. And there are so many different ways that we can sort of jump into this stream of particularly when we talk about AI in particular. So I'm wondering if maybe you could talk maybe at a high level about how you work with clients on on figuring out 
where to start. Cause I think there can be a tendency to think, oh, well, either I'm all in and I'm doing all the things, I'm, sh I'm tasting all the shiny red objects or I'm not doing anything and I feel left behind. I feel like I'm not doing enough to keep my organization on the curve or ahead of the curve. Uh, that's a really good point, Miko. And I, and I do think we hear that a lot. I think that we have a lot of uh, clients that come to us and say, you know, uh, I feel like I've, I'm, I am behind. The reality is, is that, um, you know, we're at a, an inflection point with technology, particularly when it comes to artificial intelligence. I don't know, to be blunt, that many organizations are truly behind. I think there is a framework for how you proceed, however. So I think you have to think about that in as an organization in a logical way. And so then part of it is, um, you know, just understanding that it's here and you need to do something and then having a structured way to get after it in, in terms of really doing the work to to make it a reality. Uh, I, you know, to me, at the end of the day, there's there's and I and, and I Bailey, we have a structured process around how you think about that. And so. Um, you know, the first thing is just knowing that you want to do it and you know that it's a, you know, it's, uh, uh, it, it's the reality and then having a, a plan to do uh, stepwise improvements on how you get after it. And we'll cover much more of that over the course of the week as well. Yeah. You know, Miko, that's a great way to frame this, this whole conversation. And as Jeff said this week, but let's back up the bus just a little bit and, and talk to us about generative AI, how it works. I mean, is this like one whole system or is it lots of different systems? Because it seems like everybody is coming into the marketplace place and almost branding AI as a, as their own function. Like, so how does that work? I, and Julia, you're right. And, and I think that's part of the confusion and uh, uncertainty. It's um, the, the labels, everything is AI and generative AI is now AI. So let me, I'll try to make it as simple and straightforward as I can, knowing that it's not simple and straightforward. <laughs> but, um, and I'll start with the definition definition of AI. AI has really been around for a long time. It's been us trying to uh, allow computers and machines to do cognitive work that human beings do. And it's been around for 80 plus years. If you look back to some of the earliest inventions and patents that, that have come out around trying to um, create human intelligence. Uh, there's also uh, then kind of an evolution of that. And so things like machine learning around data uh, and, um, and some of the other things that are uh, possible there have been around for quite some time as well. I think the biggest change and the reason it's top of mind and, and really has bubbled to the surface is the concept around generative AI. And generative AI is really and truly, I would say, the first set of capabilities that has become, from a, a computer thinking perspective, if you will, has become available to almost everyone. So if you have a computer and you have access to the internet, you can experience this capability. And it's a type of artificial intelligence. And the difference uh, with generative AI is it learns. Uh, it can learn based on lots of different things. It learns based on a massive amount of data and it learns uh, and can do lots of different things in terms of creative work that humans can do um, reasonably well today, so. So Jeff, picking up on that point about this generative AI being a form of AI that is accessible to uh, a broader range of folks, not just someone who's working in maybe a specialized lab at IBM, for example, um, <laughs> but anyone who has a computer, anyone who has an even now like a, a mobile phone can can access some of these features at an organizational level. How should organizations be thinking about these capabilities? Right. So in, in other words, what are the things that it can do to support organizations and what are the things that organizations should be considering in terms of if they're going to use AI, perhaps there's a bucket of tasks or activities they should be thinking about when they think about, yeah. you know, the, the current form of AI that we have access to. I, I think organizations need to think about it as something that can supplement their organization relative to 
their goals and objectives. And when I say that, I mean, think about it in terms of tasks and, um, and capabilities it's good at. I do think the risk you have with generative AI and AI in, in, in particular is people think it's a magic wand and it's not a magic wand. It is a tool like you have in any other toolbox. And so thinking about how you might leverage that for tasks that make the most sense is really the first start for, for AI. And, and, and then honestly, understanding what the, you know, what type of capabilities it has, how does it meet uh, your organizational needs, and then how do you optimize that as you go forward? And, and so for generative AI in particular, there are some really good things that it does pretty well. That's so that's start so start there and say, here's how we use it. And then the second piece of that in my mind is make sure you don't just let it do it do what it does and, and then send it out, right? Like you don't want it to do a certain set of capabilities and don't proofread it and don't incorporate it into your work. Um, you just send it as it is. And because if you do that, then you, you really run some risk. So yeah. so Jeff, just one follow up on this. So can we maybe talk about some concrete examples. So what broadly would you say that generative AI is perhaps something we should consider using as or what is it good at in the organizational context? And perhaps what are some things going back to your point about waving the magic wand that perhaps we shouldn't be looking to generative AI to do? Yeah, so I, it's a good question. Uh, lots of examples there where it works really well and in, and in others where it doesn't. There are um, generating content from a large language model relative to um, kind of the broad knowledge of the internet and then supplementing that with um, validation from a human being. That's actually something it does pretty well. And so that's content not, creation is, is yeah, that what so content reason? creation, okay. uh, image, uh, image creation, text, you know, uh, images, et cetera. That's a really good sweet spot for generative AI today. Okay. Um, when you when you talk about this, Jeff, it's it's a uh, I think it's also really important to kind of frame this up is that things are changing so damn fast that <laughs> this conversation that we're having, um, you know, you talked about that this technology is not necessarily old, but it's just now being uh, spread throughout the masses. And when Nico said, you know, you can get this technology on your cell phone and you know how it's how it's becoming more of a, a framework for how we work and how we live how fast is this changing i mean this discussion that we're having today and and guiding people into the concept of of using this technology how is this going to look in six months 12 months 24 months <laughs> and if i had the answer to those questions <laughs> Julia, I would um, I, I would be very rich in twenty four months. <laughs> um, I, what I will tell you is that in my in my history and in my experience, this is the fastest. This is the most exponential growth technology I've personally seen. And so, for context, Chat GPT three five came out in twenty twenty three. That's last year, <laughs> and so. <laughs> And so if you look at the number and the explosion of large language models and the way generative AI um, is, is being incorporated and being built and the investment that's going into it, it's changing. It is changing daily, honestly. And, and, and that's really that that's what it's how it's working. The key, I think, is being principled and understanding what that means to your organization how you make the right platform bets and think about things like security and privacy and all the other components that come along with that. And, um, and then really, you know, focusing on where you go from here. But like I said, I, I mean, machine learning and deep learning, that's been around for a while. Now we're really starting to expose some of that to um, users in, in a way that frankly needs to be thought about from an organizational perspective, especially if they just use the internet to use chat GPT. Right. You know, Miko, you brought up something um, that was really interesting about 
saying, well, how can we be using this and and how should we be using this? And I got to ask the question, it's this is changing the nonprofit sector in, in a way that is pretty remarkable. How do we know where it is with our organization and how it, it is changing our sector? Because I got to say, Jeff, I feel like there's that group that's like in on the secret and they're using it and they're cranking it up. And then there's that other group that they're not using at all. And so they're falling behind. And I, and I think there, there are organizations who are on the front end of using it and getting the value. I also think that there are a lot of organizations that feel like they're falling behind, but maybe are not. Um, but they feel like it because of the hype and the, the noise around it. What I would say is you have to think about your organization and the and going back to what I said earlier, sort of the use cases, what makes sense for you um, and when you understand sort of what it's capable of, especially when it's generative AI. Um, what is it capable of and what is it not? And so if you think about the larger AI umbrella versus generative AI, we could, we'll spend more time on that, you know, over the course of this week, but there are things that absolutely you can take advantage of. And it's relatively, you know, reasonably uh, priced from a, how do I start? But the key is again, going, going back to how do you think about that from a, an organizational perspective? How do you think about, what do I need to think about relative to data and security and, and privacy and legislation and all those other things uh, that we will uh, talk about throughout this week? But I, what I would say to organizations who think they're behind, I would say you aren't necessarily behind, but you need to be thinking about it. So, so Jeff, to that point, you know, as you were talking, I one of the way or I, I guess a metaphor for the way i'm thinking about this is if you think about ai maybe as maybe like an, an intern that you bring into your organization to focus on a certain set of tasks that intern could probably add a lot of value to your organization but you're going to have to provide some direction right you're going to have to provide some training for that right and perhaps um there's an opportunity for organizations to learn maybe how to recruit the right intern. And once they're in the organization, how to train that intern on the things that are gonna help maybe your organization achieve more efficiency. So how does that land for you? And, and what what yeah. are your thoughts about that? I think that's 100% correct, Miko, relative to generative AI and how you interact with generative AI. Um, I would say that, you know, Microsoft came out with some really good principles, sort of how do you do a prompt um, mm. guidance and the, the art of the prompt is a, is a real thing. Meaning mm -hmm. you can't just say, tell me everything you know about it. subject X, right? Because then you're going to get a lot of, um, a lot of stuff back that frankly you don't want. And I think the other thing that's really important is that, you know, generative AI, uh, Every time you ask it a question, even if you ask it the same question, will come back slightly differently. That's an important uh, thing we'll talk about, uh, if, you know, from a Gen AI perspective later this week. But the key of uh, getting the what you want out of it is asking the right question. And then to your point about interns, assume you get a different intern every time <laughs> you start a question. And so having a library of things that you know how to ask, I think is the right thing to do as well. So, You know, I think it's a fascinating thing. And I love the concept of the intern because Miko, we've all had interns where we get ready for them to show up. We put all our eggs in that basket, <laughs> our hopes, our dreams, our aspirations. And we think, holy moly, they're going to just make my life so much easier. And then we forget about management that we have to manage this talent. We have to manage the process. And I think that's, um, Jeff, you know, you're bringing up the prompts, the concept of a prompt and how we manage that. To me, it was in the beginning of AI, it was kind of like a parlor trick. And I'll be really candid with you. And within my family, we used it to create um, cocktails. 
And we would be like, we have in our refrigerator a lime, a seven up and, a, you know, piece of celery or whatever. What can you make? And then everybody just thought it was hilarious and really interesting and fun. And then that was back in the day, literally, when we were trying to figure out what is this. And now when I go to work, um, I have become more refined in how I use this tool from the get go with the prompt. And I think it's a really interesting thing to say, yeah, there's an art to this. There's a management to this concept. There, there absolutely is. And I think generative AI, the reason it's exciting, and I think it's another force multiplier to see more AI um, in organizations going forward is it makes it accessible. It makes it understandable. And then um, the key from an organizational perspective is harnessing that and then, and then building on it. There are, there's a narrow lane where generative AI in an organization is really good. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the rest of AI can help from there. So generative AI plus distinct knowledge about your organization and your organization data and how do you make those things work together, that's really, that applied AI is really where magic happens long term. So yeah. maybe, I, maybe I do know what 12 months looks like. <laughs> Well, I, I think you just made a really good point, and I think you've emphasized this a couple of times, which is for folks that sort of reading between the lines, is you you need a good human and good AI to work together, right? It's, it's not the AI sort of going off and sort of doing its thing in order for it to be effective and useful and, and efficient, especially in this organizational context for nonprofits. You have to have sort of this this synergy between the humans right? The people and also the, the technology. Is that a good way to see this? I think it's a great way, Nico, to, to, to frame it. And I would say that what you do to me, um, we, we do a lot of different technologies, but when Microsoft came out with the, the, the brand co-pilot, that's exactly what it is, right? Like yeah. you don't want the co-pilot to be taking off and landing on their own while the pilot sits there. <laughs> What you want is somebody to help guide them and give them advice and give them feedback or tell them something's happening they should be aware of, right? So that that's the way I think about it. And I, I so again, I, I just thought when that came out, that's the right way to think about it. And it's about supplementing what humans do best, which is cognitive, compassionate, rational thought versus just a relying on a machine. Right, yeah. And I think speaking of machines, this, I think one final thing, thought to sort of round out this, this part is, you know, often when we think about programming, for example, we think about databases, you often hear, it, perhaps even in accounting, right? You know, garbage in, garbage out, right? And so it's about the technology, it's about the people, but it's also about the quality of direction or information or data that you're feeding into this loop with the human and the, the technology. For sure. And that, you know, you know, as we think about the rest of the time we'll spend uh, this week, that's the baseline. Data, data is where um, machine learning and AI gets its information. And so it's the classic for those of us who are um, seasoned enough to have been you know, developers back in the day is garbage in, garbage out. If you create not good data, then you're not going to good get good responses and, and answers um, from AI as well. So, I do think that's a really good point. Um, data security, um, governance, all those things will be topics we cover as we go through this week, which I'm excited about. Well, it's an interesting thing because I think to Miko's point, um, you know, and and Jeff, you you started off this conversation this way is that um, this is a joint process. You're, you're not going to be able to employ this tool and just think everything's going to be rainbows and unicorns. I mean, for those of us in the nonprofit sector, who've ever had to start a database or customer, you know, uh, management system, or we think, oh, this is going to take all of our, you know, problems, all of our donor information is going to be great. 
And then the disappointment or the frustration because we haven't aligned our expectations. It's pretty stunning. So let's talk about this risk reward issue. What does this time frame look like? How long is it going to take us to get up to speed to even have this to your to your, you know, the, the Microsoft example, this co-pilot with us? Right. And, and I think there are ways. So the, you deal with the risks and then you start reaping the rewards. Right. So that's the way that's the way we think about it. The risks are real, you know, security, privacy, legislation. What should you do? What shouldn't you do? How do you get your organization ready? Everybody wants to just go plug it in and it works to your point. Right. And then they're going to be disappointed when it doesn't do what they wanted it to do. And so being planful about that, thinking about it relative to your organizational goals, objectives, um, sort of what your challenges are, that's that's where we start. Um, we don't even talk about solutions until we say, let's talk about, you know, we talk about solutions in terms of what do you want out of it? And then we go back to, okay, so here's what you need to do from a data security, all those good things. Beyond that, um, there are, pretty significant rewards that are available um, uh, for nonprofits and lots of other industries. And I think from a generative AI perspective in particular, um, it's a great way to get started on AI, meaning it makes it, as I mentioned earlier, accessible and understandable to, to users. And so if you do that, then you really create a foundation for how do you then evolve this? What's the next thing we could do that would be amazing? You, you know, if you can save a handful of hours a week, uh, per you know, from a from an individual perspective, you can pay for the tools and you can serve your you know clients and constituents and 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 donors and and, and everybody else better, right? Like the people that are funding your organization, all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love that, that you put it into that context, Jeff, because um, it's not just this magic bullet. It's, it's a tool just like we think about, you know, our, our phones as tools or our laptops as tools, um, you know, our iPads, understanding how it can work with us. And Miko, I think about the mindfulness of this and how we look at um sometimes we bring this technology into our lives with an expectation and then it totally messes us up, messes us up because we actually um, kind of like feel like we failed or we were not, you know, you use that phrase, we're behind the gun, you know, and it's, it's a really an interesting conundrum. Jeff, this has been fascinating. And, and, you know, as a kickoff for nonprofit power week, we have a lot of things to be talking about. Um, we're going to be talking about, how this generative AI really is impacting our nonprofits and how we can start, how we should be preparing ourselves so that we can navigate through this in a thoughtful and effective way. Um, and then what does it look like to win? I love asking this question. You know, a lot of times we get, uh, we get so busy trying to do something, but then we have to really step back and say, okay, is this a win? Is this helping us? Is this, actually doing what we need it to do and then getting started where do we start and and some of these these questions will really orient around security and process and and protection of critical information and then at the end of the week we're going to be asking and uh getting the answers uh to uh, questions that come in that we've had so as you are watching um this with us if you have questions, reach out to us. You can access us through any of our socials. And then let us know what your thoughts are and, and your questions that you might be having. Um, as we said at the beginning of the show, this is changing every 24 hours. So what we start talking about on Monday might be different on Friday, right? And so I think this is just a fascinating, fascinating uh, conversation to have. And again, we'll have Jeff with us throughout the week. Um, Miko will be joining us as well, really drilling down into this navigation of a new tool. I Bailey is well known as a national leader um, in the accounting and financial services sector with a very robust nonprofit uh, practice. 
But Jeff, I'm fascinated that we're having this conversation outside the parameter of traditional accounting. And I think it's, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's going to be pervasive and understanding the impacts. Now is the time. So right. I love it. Well, now is the time. Jeff Hensel, uh, director with I Bailey, um, one of our great partners. I Bailey's been with us from the beginning and really are a thought leader. Again, I'm Julia Patrick. I've been joined by the amazing Miko Marquette Whitlock, the mindful techie. So this is the perfect week, Miko, to have you engaged in this asking great questions and then giving us some uh, new ways to think about things. So I'm just thrilled that you are here with us. I'm also thrilled to have these presenting sponsors that really join us day in and day out so we can have these fascinating conversations. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller. These are the folks that really get behind these amazing conversations that we're able to have day in and day out. Nearly 1,200 episodes, and we're now in our fifth year of broadcasting. So there's a lot of content, but there's still so much more content to explore. As we sign off each and every episode, we want to remind ourselves, our viewers, our listeners to stay well so you can do well. See you again. Thank you, everyone.